Okay, so I'm without further ado, I would like to ask you all to welcome our this year's winner of the European Eppendorf Young Investigator Award, Adrian, come to the stage. So it's my particular pleasure to hand you over the Eppendorf Young Investigator Award. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Here is, uh, let me just open it up. Thank you so much for that very excessively kind introduction and for the honour to be here and to be the Eppendorf Prize recipient of this year. So I wasn't sure exactly what I should talk about because this is not meant to be a talk about one paper, but the topic of my lab is actually rather diverse, so it's a little bit difficult to say, to integrate everything into one story. So I just want to talk about one story today, but I will give a bit of an overview about the overwhelming theme of the lab. It's very simple. What we'd like to know is why variation between people makes some people develop immune diseases? Why are some people more prone to develop autoimmune diseases or autoinflammatory diseases? And so one way, of course, of looking at this is as a geneticist. And we do genetic studies to try to work out why some genes are going to be making individuals prone to developing autoimmunity. But our interest is not just in identifying genes or in um, finding a GWAS and then get some links and leaving it at that. We really want to work out the mechanism by which variation in genes or other types of variation ultimately end up in disease. Because of course, genes don't directly cause disease. What we have in immune diseases is that genes are responsible for editing the basic development of the immune system. For example, T cells develop in the thymus and these early developmental effects really imprint on whether or not the cells are going to be pathogenic or protective. The other effect, of course, is downstream. What happens to the immune cells when they're interacting with all of these other immune cells in the periphery? And we have, for example, the interaction of our inflammatory cell types with our regulatory cell types. And this interaction is what's going to decide whether or not we have an immune reaction or we have a lack of immune reaction. And finally, of course, you don't get a disease until you destroy the tissue. And it's really the interaction of the immune system with the tissue is another really critical part of this process of going from genetic variation the whole way into disease process. Now, my lab works on both mice and humans, and there are really great advantages and disadvantages to both species. Mice really have been essential for the development of immunology. They give us outstanding resolution. We can do functional testing in vivo. We wouldn't be where we are in immunology without mice to identify all of the moving parts. And of course, we can, do, we can control the genetic variation, the environmental variation, which makes a lot of experiments easier, but ultimately they are the wrong species. You know, we, we would like to, at some point, start curing diseases in humans as well as, well as mice. So humans have had the advantage that we're actually working on the right species. We're working on the people we want to cure. But there are difficulties. You know, it's difficulty to run in vivo testing. And of course, you've got all of this uncontrolled variation. When you're used to working on mice and you have these you know, nice, very tight error bars and everything is very easy to do, and then you're working on humans and they're just a mess. Um, <laughs> not, not you humans, but other humans. <laughs> um, of course, I think actually that maybe we're over estimating that this variation is actually a problem. In fact, I would make the case that we are excessively controlling the variation in mice, that we are almost crippling mice as a research model by using only a single inbred strain to control genetic variation. We're crippling mice as an inbred model by using these SPF situations in very sterile, homogenous environments. And actually, I think this uncontrolled variation in humans is probably the most important part of immunology to study now. We know the moving parts in the immune system. What we want to study is the variation, because it's the variation between human to human that leads to the immunological diseases that we want to cure. I think one of the things that's holding us back in immunology is by this reliance on what I'll call the holotype model. 
So in the definition of species, we tend to use an anatomical definition. And an anatomical definition of species is actually remarkably simple. We have a single platonic idea, ideal of a species. And this is often boiled down to a single specimen. So this, for example, is the type specimen, the holotype of this species of butterfly. And this is considered to be the ideal platonic version of this butterfly. And every other individual is a deviation from this butterfly. Now, this is a very useful construct. I mean, it is a construct, but it's a very useful construct for classification, for anatomical studies and so forth. But it does start to hit this limit when you try to incorporate evolution. Because, of course, the species is not constant, the species is changing, and yet we have this unchanging holotype. At what point does one species become another species? At what point is it a variation, a deviation of one holotype versus a deviation of a second holotype? In the same way, I think we are using this holotype model in medical research, or at the very least in immunological research. And by this I mean, let's say we are looking at a relatively simple experiment. Here we did an experiment to look at humans that have um, either healthy individuals, individuals with one autoimmune disease or a second autoimmune disease. And if we look at the number of inflammatory cells, we can see that there is a statistical increase in this inflammatory population in multiple sclerosis. That's the disease we're looking at. And so our normal way of looking at this would be, okay, we've got statistical tools to filter out all of this noise and we have a significant difference. So in multiple sclerosis, this average goes up. And if you like, that's the, that's the holotype. That's the signal that we're saying is important and is driving disease. And all these individual dots, that's just noise. We're trying to get rid of the noise. And again, I think this idea is, is a useful construct, especially for statistics and for detecting changes in disease. But it really does fail when we start trying to explain why individuals get disease. Overall, that people with multiple sclerosis have more of these inflammatory cell types. But this individual here has many fewer than the average of the control. And this individual here has many more than the average of the disease individual. So we fail once we start trying to look at the individual levels and the personalized response. So I think the, the point I really want to make here is that diversity in the immune system is not just a statistical problem to overcome with a large N. It's not something that's just noise that we need to filter out. It's actually something that we need to understand. And the reason we need to understand it is because the diversity in the immune system is actually an evolved feature. Yeah, I mean, it's really a feature, not a bug. And we have, the reason why it's a feature is because of what we call the Red Queen paradox in evolution. So the Red Queen paradox is to take the example of a relationship between predator and prey species. The, the prey species are constantly evolving to get faster so they can outrun the predator, and the predator species are constantly getting faster so they can catch the prey. Now, on average, the two populations keep on increasing the speed, and it's kind of this arms race between the two. Now, that's for predator and prey. In the immune system, it's quite different because we do have an arms race between the host and the pathogen, between the individuals, in human individuals, and the pathogens, the bacteria, the viruses. But the problem is it's an asymmetrical arms race. Pathogens can always evolve faster. Even if we had the perfect immune system, an unbeatable immune system, that would last a generation. Because with very high mutation rates, with very short generation times, it's asymmetrical. The pathogen will always rapidly be able to come up with a system that can beat that one perfect immune system. In fact, the only defense the host has is variation because evolution can make you rapidly overcome one perfect immune system. But if you have diversity in a population, and in fact you don't have one immune system, you have a thousand immune systems, a hundred thousand immune systems, a pathogen cannot evolve simultaneously to overcome a hundred thousand different immune systems. And as it moves from host to host, you're protected by this diversity. It's really a key feature of the immune system. It's also the reason why some individuals are healthy their whole life, and other individuals are going to develop autoimmune diseases, chronic infectious diseases, allergic diseases, inflammatory diseases. I think it's important to keep in mind that something like half of the population of the planet ultimately dies of an immune-related disease. So we need to understand this diversity and the source of this diversity, because if we can control it, then we can start to try to treat these diseases or prevent the diseases. So the question that 
really I'd like to ask for today's talk is what shapes the human immune system. Now, when you're studying the human immune system in terms of diversity, there are a couple of limitations that you have just with technical reasons. You really need to have a highly detailed analysis, but you also need to do it at a very large scale. And normally we have this trade-off. We either do high detail or high end, but in, for these types of studies, you really need to do both. We also need to design our human cohort around trying to identify the causative factors. And humans are not so easy to design. You have to take humans as they are. So it's another difficulty in this. It's really only in the last few years that different groups have started to approach this by doing the high depth, high um, cohort number studies. And there's a few studies that have done this. This is one by the Mark Davis Laboratory where they're analyzing the immune variation and their focus was on the genetics. And the outcome of this was that they would say something like 23% of the variation from individual to individual in the immune system is genetic in basis. Another study, this one performed in Sardinia, said that something like 40% of the variation is genetic in origin. And another one by um, uh, Christophe Benoit's group showed that 22% of the variation from individual to individual is genetic. Now these are really important studies and those groups and our group are also trying to chase down exactly which variants are modifying which immunological parameter. But the other important thing from these figures is that we're missing more than half of the story. If only 20 to 40% of the variation is genetic in origin, well, that means something like 60 to 80% is non-genetic. And in fact, this is the exciting part to me because in modifying the environment is going to be much easier than modifying the genotype. So we started up this question. Um, this was a project that was really coordinated and spearheaded by James Dooley in the lab. And what we decided to do is to take make up a platform, very high detail, but something that we could roll out really over hundreds and hundreds of individuals to try to answer the source of the variation. So I won't go into the details. Really, you don't need to know much immunology except to know that we tried to do a pretty comprehensive analysis of multiple different factors that are important in the immune system. And we tried to make it robust so that we could do the assay one day or a year later and get really have no technical variation that was in the way. So what we in the end decided on is 64 param parameters in the immune system that are quite fundamental to how the immune system operates. And we uh, profiled these on 670 individuals that are healthy and also several hundred that had disease, which I won't talk about today. The other important thing about these individuals is that we, they weren't just selected randomly. We really wanted to select sub-cohorts so that we could answer very specific questions about the nature of variation in the immune system. And I'll go through some of the different sub-cohorts later on. The first question we had, though, is what is the nature of variation in the immune system? And we really came up with two starting hypotheses. Uh, it could either be random or it could be stable. Now, if we take this graph over here as a representation of immunological space, so every point on this space will be a, a variant in how the immune system will be. For example, this individual here you could imagine being having a bias towards type 1 immune responses, whereas this individual could have a bias towards type 2 immune responses, and an individual over here could have highly suppressive immune responses. The point is that this map is meant to portray variation. Now, one possibility is that the variation we see from individual to individual is not constant. We take a snapshot on one day, and they might be here and here. Another day, they might be reversed positions. That would be a really unstable model where the immune system is just constantly changing an individual. The other model is where the immune system is stable within an individual, but it's different between individuals. And so here you can imagine that like space-time being warped, we have this warping in immunological space where there's only minor variation. So the individual that's type 1 biased is always going to be type 1 biased and it's going to really stay focused on this small area of immunological space, whereas another individual might be type 2 biased and they're again going to be really biased towards this very small space of the immune system variation. So the way we analyzed this was to take 200 individuals and we assess their immune system, how they, where they were on the variability scale, and then assess them again at six month intervals. And this is just kind of a summary graph, but we can see here with a lot of different immunological parameters 
the light grey bars represent how much of the variation is really between individual to individual. And the dark grey at the bottom is how much variation is present within an individual over time. And without looking at any of the numbers, you can see straight away that what we have is a very stable state. Individual immune systems are different from each other, but they're not changing within an individual over time. They're extraordinarily stable over large six-month blocks. So we have a very stable state in the immune system. Of course, these individuals were continuously healthy during this time. So it is possible, in fact, that we still have changes in the status of the immune system because of infections or other immunological challenges. So the question here is, is this variation stable and elastic or stable and inelastic? So by elastic, I mean you have a situation where an individual might have this particular bias in the immune system. If that individual gets an infection, their immune system has to change dramatically, but afterwards it's going to fall back into the same state. So they have this elasticity where they rebound to this original starting point in the immune system that they have. The other model is one that's non-elastic. So here you might have an original starting point, you have an infection, it changes the immune system, and then after the infection, the immune system is going to settle down into a completely novel state. So here it's still stable for a given period of time, but an infection is going to destabilize everything and it's going to settle down in a new state. So we'd call that a non-elastic model. So how can we study this? Well, for this we started up a study of severe untreated gastroenteritis, uh, which we called the fun holiday study. So the way this was designed is we had people coming in before their holiday. Um, we specifically targeted people that were going to areas that had a very high risk of developing gastroenteritis. And we, um, we profiled their immune system. We looked at you know, the position they have on their variability. Then we said, go have fun on your holiday. Try the local street food. <laughs> Don't worry about washing your hands too much. And half of the 50 individuals in this came down with um, severe acute gastroenteritis over their holiday. So you can see this is the sample point beforehand. Then the grey bar is on holiday. And you know this individual here had two days of severe gastroenteritis. This poor individual here, I think, had nine out of their 12 holidays was spent um, in one single place. And then um, they're all also they're all nice enough to not take antibiotics, just to let the let it run a natural course. They came back then after the holiday, and we looked at the immune system again afterwards. And so we can really say how much did the immune system change from individual to individual who were continuously healthy, and how much did it change in individuals that had a massive microbiological and immunological challenge. And the answer is it didn't change at all. So this is another summary graph, and it's looking at the amount of difference, and these, these differences are, are very small. But this is the average difference between individuals that were continuously healthy and individuals that had this acute untreated gastritis, and there's nothing. So this tells us that even though the immune system must have been changing during this holiday uh, and during this challenge, once they came back, their immune system bounced back to where it was beforehand. And so this is why I would say it's the, the elastic model. Now, a problem, though, with this system is that we couldn't go on holiday with them, so we couldn't get this time point while they were sick, and we can't really control the timing. We had an undefined period of time before and after the, the holiday and before and after the, the treatment. So for this, we wanted to really check, uh, well, the, the reviewers, but it was a good idea, uh, really wanted to check the effect of a system where we can do a controlled intervention. And so for this, we used a flu vaccination model. And this work was really done in collaboration with Michelle Lindemann from the Babraham Institute, an amazing collaborator. And what we did is we profiled the immune system on day zero. We then gave them a vaccination. So we're now challenging their immune system with influenza. We're looking at day seven, which is the peak day of the immune response. So we can detect the changes, and then we look again on day 42, so we can say what's happened after the resolution of the immune system. And so we can see here, we have immunological changes that happen on day seven, and then on average, everything comes back down. These changes are the type of ones you'd expect in a vaccination with um, T cell producing, uh, sorry, antibody producing cells going up. But the question still remains, even though on average, the population is normal. That doesn't mean that every individual has gone back to their original status. So you could imagine a situation where the averages on day 0 and 42 for every parameter are the same, but an individual that might have been at the top of one parameter 
on day zero may now be at the bottom of that parameter on day 42. They could just be this random reshuffling. So the way to look at this is to do something called a z-score. And a z-score is basically a measure of how far each individual is from this average point. So an, an individual higher or lower than the population average. And we can measure these z-scores on day zero and on day 42, and you see a really nice correlation. I mean, p times 10 to the minus 16 is one of the personal best in the lab. And um, this really tells us that we can predict extremely accurately someone's profile on day 42 after a challenge by just looking at their profile before a challenge. They really are rebranding to the same point relative to everyone else that they had before a challenge. So this tells us that we have variation that I would say is both stable and elastic. It's stable because it more or less stays in a single place for an individual over a period of years. And if we challenge the immune system, it can change, but afterwards it defaults back into the stable status. So that tells us something about the nature of the variation in individual to individual. But it doesn't actually answer the question of why is the initial starting point different for this individual versus that individual? What is the variation that is driving why one individual is present in this spot and another at that spot? Again, 25, 40% will be genetic, but what about the rest? Well, we used epidemiological tools to really analyze a lot of different parameters, uh, BMI, sex, psychological factors, and so forth. And there are a lot of factors that have very small effects. But there are two factors that had quite large effects. Now, the second largest effect is age. And here we see that of the 64 parameters we measured, 10 of them have a very strong correlation with age. And basically, it's the type of thing you might expect if you follow the aging field. You have a decrease in what we call the precursor populations of the immune system. Young individuals have a lot of precursors that are ready to develop into new immune cells, whereas older individuals have fewer precursors that are circulating. We also have an increase in inflammatory populations as people age. Not all inflammatory populations, but what I'd call the type 1 inflammatory populations. So this is a very predictable change that happens in every individual in more or less the same way. So here we'd say that, yes, there is stability, and this individual is going to be different, and it's going to be stable over years, but if we're talking over decades, we're going to have this predictable change where both individuals are going from the same place, a more precursor-orientated immune system, and they're moving in the same direction to a more type 1 inflammatory immune system. So we do have this predictable change in a small set of factors. But actually, the strongest effect was something that surprised us, and this effect was cohabitation. So for this, we looked at 138 parents that had a child living at home. And if you just look at those couple, the, the parents in a couple, um, and compared them to random strangers, what you saw is that the immune response, the immune system of parents was much more similar than they were to strangers, much more than we expected. So this is a rough measure of immunological variation. And you can see that this male over here is quite an outlier, at least immunologically, and his um, partner living at home, she is also an outlier in more or less the same location. Same as this couple here are outliers. We see pairs matching up. And if we look at it statistically, we see that the difference between individuals that, that are selected, that are paired at random, may be this large, and half of that variation just disappears when rather than matching them up with a random person, you match them up with their partner. And this is really, to me, quite phenomenal. Half of the variation that's present just disappears when you're looking at your partner, you and your partner. Keeping in mind that the genetic effect of variation, something like 20 to 40 percent, and fully 50 percent can be explained by who your partner is. So what could be driving this effect? Well, there's lots of different things that could be driving this. I mean, we know so much so many environmental effects are modifying the immune system. Your diet, your exercise, um, persistent viral infections, indoor pollutants, your, your local environment, all, the different, all of these different effects. They're, they're micro effects that are very hard to measure, but when you're living with someone, they're going to all accumulate. You're going to have the same types of diet, the same types of um, exposure to pollutants, and we think that's what's actually making your immune system more and more similar. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is um, in this particular group, the cohabiting people had 
a common factor, and that is a child. And one of our hypotheses, which um, as a father of a newborn child um, appealed to me, was that children are going to be acting as a vector for transmitting gut microflora. Um, people who haven't changed the nappy might not quite get the reference. <laughs> but um, when you are living together, you're not in a sterile environment. You're constantly exchanging microflora. And we think of children present, we may have a heightened exchange of microflora. And that could also be modifying our immune system. So this is our model for what drives the variation from individual to individual. We have a relatively stable immune system over the period of years. This is changing predictably in every person with age, and it also changes unpredictably based on the environment, such as a cohabitation event might occur, and these, these two individuals are now going to move closer together in terms of where they are in immunological space, and of course they're also going to be nicely aging together. So their immune systems are going to be converging um, into a similar point. Now this is for us just the start. I mean, this is really the first time we've tried to tackle this question of environmental influences over immune variation. It'd be wonderful to look at other contexts of shared environments, shared work environments, um, nursing homes, other places where we're exposed to common situations. And then how do these effects influence immune disease? If your immune system is being altered by your partner, is your chance of different, developing different diseases being altered by your partner? The other thing that would be really great to understand is which environmental factors are driving the convergence of each parameter. Is there a particular environmental factor that is driving the convergence of a type 1 or a type 2 immune response? Because if we knew which parameters were driving that convergence, we could potentially control the environmental influences in order to manipulate the individual immune system. And I think this is really a point that has got a high potential. Genome editing of people is going to be a long way in the future, but modifying the environment, now this is something that could potentially happen very, very quickly indeed, especially if we could identify which individuals were prone, to, were, had a risk gene for one particular type of immune response. We could try to alter their environment and take them away from that risk zone. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for being here, but I really want to thank my laboratory. This is research that is not done by me. It's done by wonderful people in my laboratory who have banned me from holding pipettes, even in Eppendorf. And, um, and really, they're, they're responsible for everything here. I especially want to point out um, James Dooley. He is the leader of this study and the leader of so much in the lab. Really, we have set up the lab together, and um, if he was not over 35, he might be the one standing up here rather than me. And um, our collaborators, especially for this study, Michelle Linterman, who's an amazing collaborator. Uh, this paper was, this story was just published in Nature Immunology, and we also put online the original data set. So if anyone wants to download it and use it as a reference population or try to untangle the variation that's present there, all of the data is there for anyone to look at. And with that, I'd like to thank you. <laughs>